Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the NZXT H6 Flow RGB. This is a full build guide where I'm going to go through and build in this case and show you the various different highlights of it. And I'm also going to be building both a standard setup and vertically mounted GPU so you can enjoy some of that. Now, as you'll see, the H6 Flow RGB is a pretty interesting case, which not only has a dual chamber setup and a lot of glass on it, but also has this interesting angled panel that you can see at the rear with three RGB fans included as standard. That's the core fans from NZXT, which means you get the RGB lighting right in the middle. Now, as you can see, I'm using a 240 mil Kraken cooler here, though more logically you'd use a 360 mil. No doubt people will point that out, but I didn't have one. And I wanted to demonstrate how you can set it up in a variety of ways. You'll also note a 120 mil fan at the back and two 140 mil fans can be installed on the bottom. Now, the case comes with three fans as standard, pre-set up and pre-wired. And there's some highlights there that I want to get into. So first of all, I'm going to unbox the case and talk about the various different features of it, show you some of the interesting highlights, and then talk about some of the complexities of it, but also just some of the nice features, because I do want to say this is a really nice case for a number of different reasons. And it's probably the best quality NZXT case I've seen next to the H9 Elite, which is also pretty fantastic. But this is a really good build quality to it and some really nice highlights. Obviously, those angled fans are pretty interesting for a start. It's nice to have three pre-included fans as standard, although it's a shame you don't get one on the rear. But then you also have the ability to top mount the 360mm radiator or extra fans at the top there. Obviously you could fit 140 mil fans at the top as well. And there's a tray at the bottom for 140 mil fans too, which we'll get to in a little while. You've got two USB-A front panels and a USB-C, plus your power button at the front. And then just this interesting, unusual design with the angled panel with the mesh front on it. So NZXT's historically been a bit meme with its airflow design, but this is a nice alternative to other sort of traditional square cases or rectangles because it now has both the glass viewability and the airflow of a mesh design all in one. So definitely some interesting highlights there. And it is a pretty compact mid tower case, which means it'll take up to an ATX motherboard. And that's what you're gonna see set up in here. And an easy setup and an easy build as well for the most part. I do have a couple of things that are worth noting that we'll get to in a minute in terms of the wiring and sort of the complexities of that, or at least the weirdities of it. But as you can see, nice mesh paneling on there as well. So good airflow and hopefully good for dust over time. The three front fans are already set up for you and they are set up to intake. So they're pulling air from that rear panel or from the side into the case, which means that they're then angled towards the graphics card, which is pretty interesting, and also obviously will help with vertical mounting as well, so it could be useful there. Now at the rear of the case, dual chamber setup, you've got space for SSDs and hard disk drives, but there's only one cage for that, so you are fairly limited on the installation. The two SSDs and one hard disk drive essentially, You've got some channeling down the left and top for your power cables and things. Although I will note that Velcro isn't quite long enough and I'll show you more of that later on. You'll see that the fans are pre-wired and they're all connected up into two single cables, which is also pretty nice. However, it does have a bit of a downside to it, but more on that in a bit. And the front side, where all the business is, is actually pretty roomy despite the compact design of it. There's plenty of room for the cables and the management of them, and it was just easy to build in. Obviously, these fans are pretty nice looking as well, and you get the RGB from both sides, as you've seen from earlier clips. At the bottom, you've got enough room for 240 mil fans, and they're kind of nestled away as well, you'll see in a second, which is pretty nice. The cabling down the left-hand side is one of the first things I want to talk about, because this was something to bear in mind, I think, if you're building in this case, is... As standard, it's all connected up and wired already for you, so you just need to connect it up to your motherboard. Now, this sounds great in theory, but once you get further into the build, if you're doing like I am, putting in extra fans and an NZXT all-in-one cooler, it does become a bit weird, and I want to show you what I mean. So I'm going to start with that. So first of all, you've got three fans with the power connection connected up via a splitter, which goes into a single connector. 
And then the same logic is applied to an RGB connection. So you've got three fans RGB connectors going into one cable, which is then for the 5 volt RGB connector on your motherboard. So to quickly demonstrate that outside the case, so you can see it nice and easily, here's a Strix motherboard Z790 that I'm working on. And the power cable will connect up to the chassis fan connections on the bottom, for example, or sys fan headers on a motherboard. So whatever motherboard you're using, the logic is there. So the fans are then powered by your motherboard, and that's how they will spin up. And then you have the RGB connection for them, which connects up to the 5-volt RGB head on your motherboard, assuming you've got one. Now, most modern motherboards do. Usually there's one at the bottom and one at the top. And so fairly logical, straightforward connection. If that's all you're doing, which obviously you aren't going to be, you're going to be installing other fans, as I am here with the F140 RGB core fans. Now, I've done a wiring guide separately on these fans that I'll link to in the description that's worth watching because it goes into some depth on the logic of it. But I am going to show you how it works and the setup for it and why that first wiring that I just showed you for the fans is kind of illogical because if we use the controller that you've just seen there with these 140mm fans, that obviously controls the RGB lighting, but that's done via NZXT's CAM software, which is controlled via USB connection on your motherboard. And if you control the lighting for these two fans that I'm putting in now via CAM, but then those three fans that are connected to your case via your motherboard software and the 5 volt connection, then you're going to have lighting that's out of sync. So it's kind of weird. And I do have a solution for that I want to talk about in a bit. But the standard, so you buy these extra fans, so I've got 240mm fans, they come with a controller. So you've got 240mm RGB core fans, they come with this RGB controller, all it does is the RGB lighting. So you plug in the RGB cable from those fans into this controller, and then the controller requires SATA power and USB connection. The fan power connects up again to the chassis fan headers or system fan headers on your motherboard, and that's how they're powered. Obviously, you have two cables, one from each of these fans, but you could get a Y splitter or a three-way splitter to plug those in and then connect them up to a single header on your motherboard. But you can see now we're using three potential fan power connections on the motherboard, one for the three fans on the front of the case and then two more for those. And then if you've got the RGB connector, that plugs into the USB connection on your motherboard. Now that then allows you to control the RGB lighting via NZXT's CAM software which is how I was doing it at the beginning of this video. And you also need SATA power for that. So that's the flat connectors that come with your power supply unit. So if you bought a PSU like the RM Shift from Corsair that I'm using here, you should have these flat daisy chainable connections which connect up and then they power the RGB hub, which then allows for the RGB lighting on your fans. Fairly logical and straightforward with the core fan wiring, but you can see now we've got two different logics in how we're wiring those fans up. And that's the one place that this case logic falls down because NZX doesn't supply an RGB controller or fan hub with the case. So you need this separately and that thing will only control three fans maximum. And obviously the F140 fans is just two fans in the box. So you then, you know, you have those, but then you have one spare connection which isn't going to be much use because you need three for those three other fans that are included in the case. So essentially what I'm saying is you need to source another controller. Anyway, we're mounting these fans bottom up, so face down towards the ground, and that's then the intake, so we're pulling air in from the bottom. You then have these longer screws that are included in the box, accessories box with the case, that you then mount from the underside. So these aren't your traditional fan screws. Don't use the screws that are included with the F140 fans. You need to use the ones that come with the case because they're ever so slightly longer, and they basically go through some rubber washers that are on the underside of the case, and you, then you screw them in. But what you will see, and what's really nice about this design, is where those fans go in, they sit in a sort of recessed area, so they're hidden, the frames of them are hidden, and the wires just run to the back. More on that in a little while. So then SSD hard disk drive tray can be removed with a thumb screw and taken out, and in there is the accessories kit that includes those fan screws that I just showed you a minute ago and uh, a few other things so multiple other screws some cable ties which I will employ a bit later on because they will be handy and that's basically it and then you've got standoffs if you need them for the motherboard if you're installing a different motherboard or if you want to use an extra standoff in place of the uh, one that's in there but you can see we've got a number 
of those and the bags are labeled and then you can obviously refer to the manual or pause the video now to see what screws are what and where they go so it's nicely labeled up in there but i'm going to try and show you that process as we go through and what's what so i'm going to start with the ssds and the mounting of those and just show you the setup for that so i've got crucial bx500 and mx500 2.5 inch ssds i'm not going to be using a 3.5 inch hard disk drive for this build the logic is fairly straightforward but i figure most people will be using ssds so that's what we're doing this time so i'm going to show you the wiring and the setup for these in this case and how you'd go about installing them obviously these are two terabyte drives so nice and roomy and fairly straightforward installation. Now you can only install two SSDs in this cage and in this case. So it's worth bearing that in mind before you get started. But you obviously need these cables, which are the SATA cables, which should come with your motherboard. And hopefully you've got some of those knocking about if you're gonna be setting this up. Then we're going to install them and I'm gonna show you the wiring of how you'd connect those up just now so you know what's what. But you have the data cable, which is the smaller cable, and you'll see there's an L-shaped connector on it. We'll plug in and then plug it into the motherboard. If you know all this already, by the way, timestamps down below so that you can skip to other parts of the video if you need to. If you already know how to do SSTs, you'll be able to skip further into the video. But if you don't, then that plugs in on the right-hand side where the SATA connections are. There's four connectors on this motherboard. Sometimes there's more. It is worth noting that on some motherboards, you may need to reposition this connector if you're using NVMe SSDs. Sometimes if you populate an NVMe port, it disables one of the SATA connections. So if you find your drive's not working, that might be why. I've seen it historically. It's not the case on this motherboard, but some of the older ones did have it, where if you put an M2 NVMe SSD in the top slot, it disabled one of the ports. So worth knowing. And then the other thing you need for your SSDs is the SATA power, which is that flat connector. Same thing we use for the RGB controller. Plug that into the SATA connection on the power supply unit and then into the SSD. Now this cable can be used for multiple drives, SSDs, hard disk drives, and for things like the RGB controllers as well, or fan controllers. And you can connect multiple things to it. So I can connect both these SSDs to that SATA connection and power both of them like that. But obviously we need a separate data connection for each. So another one of these cables connects to that drive and then to the motherboard. Fairly straightforward setup so far. I'm showing you the wiring. I'm gonna do this a lot throughout the video outside the case, just so you can see really easily how to connect these things up. Obviously you wouldn't actually plug all the cables in now because then you'll have to route the cables again later and it become complicated. But I just wanna make your life a little bit easier so you can visualize what you need to do once everything's actually installed. So that's the wiring for those two drives, all connected up and plugged in. So remember that logic for later on, once you've actually installed them in the case and you finalize the build, because you'll need to plug those cables in then. So now we need to mount them into the cage and you'll require these screws, which are the M3 star five millimeter screws. And you use those to mount in the various different points in this cage. You put the two, SSDs basically upside down with the connectors facing towards the bottom because that's where you're going to access them from the bottom of your case once it's installed back in. And then obviously you've got eight screws to screw in if you're using two drives or four if you're just using the one and then just go through the process of securing those. Now this cage will also take the hard disk drive and that would mount underneath where the SSDs are now. As I said, I'm not going to cover that in this video it is in the manual fairly straightforward but you can see there is space for it there so it should be pretty simple and then this just slots back in now you'll notice on the case itself there are some hooks and these basically line up with the rear of the case behind the motherboard tray there and at the back as well so you have to just slide it into those and then secure it back in place with the thumb screw so pretty straightforward and it just tightens back in so really easy fitment there and actually is well thought out because your power cables and your data connections are pretty easy to plug in with that angle as well. So for this build, I'm using the Strix Z790A Gaming Wi-Fi 2. This is the second iteration of this board. I did a video separately on the original, and I'm going to do a review on this one soon. And I'm using the Core i9-14900K along with a mass of NVMe SSDs. This is an LGA 1700 motherboard and I'm going to be using an NZXT cooler with it as you've seen as well. 
Really nice looking board and it will fit wonderfully with this build. But more importantly, it's got a number of other highlights, including DDR5 compatibility, and you can use up to 8,000 mega transfers a second in the RAM now with the 14900K. And what I'm going to do is install the T500 from Crucial, which is a new NVMe SSD. It's Gen 4 and it's a replacement for the P5 Plus. But the interesting thing about this board is it will take multiple drives. So you can actually fit five drives in here, which is insane. I'm going to use the T500 to demonstrate the standard installation. And I'm going to show you where to install the others. So this is a Gen 4 drive, which can get up to 7,400 megabytes per second read write speeds. So very nifty and super fast and much easier to install than the 2.5 inch SSDs I just showed you because it basically just slots into the motherboard. Now I've done various guides on NVMe SSDs and the things to bear in mind, including whether you should take the stickers off of them and how much difference the heat shields make. The answer to that is don't take the stickers off and do use the heat shields and i've gone into a lot more depth than that in those other videos that i'll link to in the description but underneath the heat shielding that you remove there which helps dissipate the heat from the drives you'll find some stickers and then some thermal pads underneath the drives slot into place and then they have these little plastic latches which basically just twist over the top and hold them down which is really nice because historically it used to be an m2 screw another sticker comes off and then the heat shield goes back on top now this helps dissipate the heat and it does work really well and I've shown it historically with other testing because it helps keep those drives cool and if they run cool they run better because if they get too hot they will thermal throttle. The bottom of the board will also take another four drives and I'm going to do some testing on this but in my early experience of it is that all of these drives will run at their correct speeds without negatively impacting the GPU which is pretty fantastic. So if you want a motherboard of loads of storage, this is a great option potentially. Core i9 14900K goes in next. And I am trying to set up the motherboard and basically set everything up beforehand before we go about installing it, because it's much easier to do now than it is later on when you've got it installed in the case. Far less fiddly, especially when it comes to setting up the AIO. Next up is Corsair's Dominator Titanium 1st Edition DDR5 RAM. So this is 7,200 mega transfers per second RAM. It's pretty cutting edge and it is expensive. But this is a 1st Edition kit, which is basically like a collector's edition. It's pretty fancy. They're numbered individual RAM sticks and basically rolled out of the factory in a fancy little setup that includes a nifty little screwdriver, which is really nice. So nice that it's making me think about abandoning my iFixit kit because it's really swanky. And it has a setup that includes its own little heat spreaders or RGB lighting. And you've seen the RGB and I probably will demonstrate the heat spreaders in the future. So we'll get to that in a second. But I just want to show this RAM off because it's such a nice kit that it's worth just sort of showing off briefly and talking about now. Obviously two sticks of DDR5 and it's definitely not low profile. You can see it's pretty chunky and quite tall, although that isn't a problem in this case. But if you are thinking about a different build, then you might want to bear that in mind. But it's also very fast and it takes advantage of the newer platform. So the 14th generation and just the speeds that are achievable now. And obviously XMP is pretty stable now as well. So the DDR5 is less of a problem with this end and you're getting some blisteringly fast speed and also really premium build quality out of this Dominator Titanium. Some of the nicer looking RAM out there. The thing that's interesting about it is as well as the RGB that you have on there, you also have the option to remove the top of the RAM with just little screws that are holding it in place and swap it out with so you've got some heat spreaders instead to help keep the RAM running cool. So if you're not a fan of RGB, which obviously I quite like it, as you've seen from the build and what you end up seeing, but if you're not a fan and performance is more your thing, then you can change it. But you also have the customization options and you can 3D print your own covers basically so you could actually come up with your own design to put on top as well so interesting ram <laughs> probably the most interesting ram i've seen because usually it's just a bog standard stick with some heat spreaders on it 
or maybe a bit of RGB lighting, but here you have the options. Now it is expensive, very, very pricey, but it's also very good quality and easy to customize, which is pretty nifty and fairly unusual. So with installing RAM, no matter what RAM you're using on this board, you're just using the slots uh, two and four, which is A2 and B2, the second one away from the CPU and the fourth one away from the CPU, if you're using just two sticks, which most of the time you will be, with DDR5, four sticks can be a bit unstable in my experience, but those just click into place. Now for this build, I'm using the NZXT Kraken 240ml RGB. Now I will say that more logically, you'd want to use a 360ml all-in-one cooler for this, because that's what the case will take. And with a 14900K, you're probably better off with a bigger cooler. This is what I happen to have though. And I wanted to be able to demonstrate the setup process for it and what it would look like in this case. So that's what I'm doing. And it might not be logical, but there you are. So this is a nice cooler with a display on it, as you've seen. And I'm going to show you the setup process now and the logic of it. And again, you'll note that this comes with the RGB controller. So there's another one. I actually end up with three of those in the build by the end of it. But it's all in one, so that means the coolant's already in there. There's already pre-applied thermal paste, and this one has the advantage of us having its own display. It's not as fancy as the Kraken Elite, though. And as you'll see, if you have GIFs on it, for example, you only get a square display in the middle, which is a bit of a downer. It comes set up ready for Intel, so perfect for this build, because it means we have far less messing about to do. It will work with AMD boards, but that means you have to mess around with the pump head in terms of the bracketing that's on there and other things. I'm working out the logic of where I'm going to install it in the case. I think because of the Dominator RAM, I want to put the tubes towards the rear of the case because that then won't interfere with the RAM. Obviously, we're top mounting this radiator. I'm going to put the tubes on the bottom of the display if possible and then just run them off to the side. So I'm just thinking about the logic of that and then working out what it'll look like in the case. And then I'm gonna mount the fans in a logical way to do that. Now, because I've got 240 mil fans on the bottom of the case intaking and three intake fans on the side that are pre-installed, I'm gonna put these fans into exhaust. So face down into the case and then the four cables are going to run towards the back. So take note of the logic of how are you gonna set that up? Where you're mounting the fans on the radiator because you need to make sure you're directing those cables towards the rear of your case so they don't end up being in the way. Then we have a bag full of screws and it has loads of long radiator screws in there. Enough actually for push-pull. So if you wanted to buy some extra fans, you could potentially do it. I don't know whether it would work in this case though. So I haven't tried it, so I can't say but you do have the option to do that. So this setup is fairly straightforward. And then the logic of the fan wiring is basically the same as I've already shown you. You have the RGB controller, which has three RGB ports on it. And obviously you only have two, one from each of the fans. And that controller then needs SATA power and a USB connection. Now you can see, as I said already, once again, we've now got 240 mil fans on the bottom, which show the controller. Then you've got the two fans on the radiator that have the controller. Then you've got the three fans on the front of the case, which have the RGB connection, or you work out how to connect them up to a controller like this. So you can control everything via cam software, which makes a lot of sense, but will require an extra purchase. But more on that in a little while. So for the all-in-one cooler, the two RGB connections from the fans connect up to the controller. And then there's a spare one. Don't worry, that spare one is basically just there if you've bought the 360 mil version of this cooler instead, because then there's a third fan and a third connection. Now on the pump head, you'll also find there is a bundle of cables included with this. That a big, large connector plugs into the pump head itself and then you need to run that cable to connect it up to multiple other things. This gives not only power to the pump to ensure that it's obviously pumping the fluid around inside, but also that your motherboard can control it, that you can see it via the cam software, and that it powers the fans. So you'll notice that it has this cable on it with three fan power connections on it. So again, you can connect the fan power up to this. So basically it's an all-in-one system where everything's controlled from this one system 
all together, which is really nice. Again, you've got a spare connector because it will also work with a 360 mil version of wiring is basically just the same. You have a USB connection and it's connect up to your motherboard in the same way that the RGB controller does. So you can control the display and that's really important. And then SATA power to the power supply unit, which again is really important if you want to power everything. And then another connector that goes to the AIO pump header on your motherboard. So just to make that clear, so you can see it all now, you connect up to the AIO pump header on the motherboard, which is just up here. And note there may well be problems in the BIOS because of that. So your BIOS might complain. So you might alternatively want to connect up to the CPU fan header instead. Then the RGB controller connects the USB connector on the bottom of the motherboard. And you'll also need a USB connection from the pump itself. Note that the Kraken cooler includes a splitter cable for this because they know that you're going to be using two USB connections and you probably only got two on your motherboard. And as I've said, we've already got RGB controllers, which also require a USB connection. So then you're running out of USB headers. Most motherboards will only have two connectors on them. So using a Y splitter like this is a good solution. So obviously from the all-in-one cooler and from the RGB controller for this, that then plugs into this cable, which then plugs into the motherboard. So you're only using one port instead of two, which makes life a lot easier. I'm going to show you another solution in a minute if you're using multiple other devices that will also be handy because you might find if you are connecting up more and more fans then you might quickly run out of USB headers and that could be one of the biggest problems that you've got. So the next setup here is to ensure that we've got the back plate installed for the cooler. It's much easier to do this now than it is when it's in the case. So you're basically just lining that up with the rear. Now, because this is an LGA 1700, you push those standoffs out to the far corners on this bracket and then thread it through the back of the motherboard. It's worth noting this motherboard is actually set up to take both LGA 1200 and 1700 style coolers. So it will work with a variety of coolers, but the far corners is for the Intel LGA 1700, which has a separate bag for its standoffs. So you can't get them mixed up. So these standoffs screw into the little back plate that's poking through those holes now. And you need to screw those into the four corners there. And make sure they're nice and tight and well secured. And then we're going to mount the motherboard with these screws, 632 star 5 millimeter. And there's multiples of those. And you'd obviously screw those into the various standoffs that the motherboard's sitting on top of. So ease that in, push it into place and that's seated down there. So this is an ATX motherboard, which as you can see, fills up the case. There's not much space at the bottom, so it does become a little bit fiddly to bulk those bottom cables in. Keep that in mind, because things like the front panel connections, the USB connections, HD audio, RGB connectors, other stuff like that, it's a little bit fiddly down the bottom there, so it's worth watching out for. Next, we're going into the power supply unit. This is the RM Shift from Corsair. I've done a separate guide for this, I'm going to show you the basic connections using a different motherboard just for demo purposes. So 24 pin power connections is split into two parts on this power supply unit, plugs in on the motherboard markings on the PSU end, and then the large part plugs in on the right hand side of the motherboard. Now this is the most important cable for powering your motherboard. If it's not secured properly on the power supply end or on the motherboard end, your PC won't power on. So if you are having trouble turning it on after you built the system, it could be this connection's a bit loose. So it's worth checking and making sure that you've seated it properly until it clicks into place because there are little notches at both ends. The logic for wiring a power supply is the same basically with every power supply unit. So don't worry that I'm using this shift one, for example, if using a different one because the setup will be the same. So that's the 24 pin power connector. And then there's two eight pin CPU power connectors on most motherboards. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's one eight and one six pin or one four pin. You're looking for the CPU cables. The smaller end plugs into the PCIe plus CPU connectors on the power supply unit. And then the other end, which is marked CPU connects into the top left of the motherboard. This allows for more power if you want to do things like overclocking. And in some instances, the motherboard will have automatically set up AI overclocking for your CPU. So it is worth connecting these up. People keep asking me whether they should. The answer is definitely you should. Why wouldn't you? If you can and you have the cables, you should plug them in. And that will make sure that your system runs smoothly as it will do. 
Um, so two cables plug in the top left. You can see on this Gigabyte motherboard, it's the same logic as with the ASUS motherboard I'm using. So they do connect up there. And again, obviously doing this once the motherboard's installed, but I want to show you it's important to get the cables plugged into the power supply unit before you try and put it in the case, just because it'll be a lot easier. I'm also using Corsair's Pro PSU cable kit for this, which isn't necessary, but it is nice because these are individually sleeved premium cables that are essentially an upgrade for this power supply. And they just make the case look a little bit nicer. They're easier to manipulate, easier to cable tie, and easier to just set up in your build and have your final system looking really swish. They are an additional purchase. Naturally, they don't come with the power supply itself, so uh, extra money, but worth it. Now, the RM shift is a bit unusual because the power cables come out of the side rather than the end. And that actually does cause me a little bit of a problem in this build which I want to show, but it's an interesting experiment in how this case works, because you can see the cable is going to come out the top of it. But anyway, seat your power supply so the fan faces towards the back of the case, because obviously it's going to pull air through the venting holes on the rear panel, and that will keep the power supply cool. And then you screw in four screws on the end of it into the case to secure it into place. Those are the hexagonal screws that are included in the accessories box. But you also get the same screws with your power supply unit generally so you'll have a spares of those so don't panic if you do have extra and then we just need to run the cables around so those cables that we just plugged in so i've got the two eight pin cpu power connectors that are going to run to the top obviously and here you have that velcro tie cable channeling at the top and down the side and what i found is negotiating these cables around there is fairly easy but there isn't actually much length to those Velcro tires, so it becomes a little bit fiddly. And there's, the channeling's not as deep as I'd like, but the end result is actually, despite my awful cable management, it ends up working okay. So plugging those cables in again now, 24-pin power connector on the right-hand side of the motherboard, and then the two 8-pin CPU power connectors on the top left. Much easier to do this now than it is after the all-in-one coolers mounted. I want to note that because there's not much space as you can see at the top. Although there is actually more than a lot of cases I've built recently, but it's so much easier to do it now and to get those sorted out. And then some cable tidying because you've got the Velcro ties, but what you'll see is if you look behind those, there are various different metal loops on the case and you can use the plastic cable ties that are included in the accessories box for the case to secure your cables down to there and tighten things up a bit. I also found these were useful because the fan cables, once you remove them from the Velcro ties, are pretty messy and haven't been tidied. So these are the fans from that front that are pre-installed. So what I did there was I just went through and I cable tidied those. The idea being to neaten them up to make sure they're taking up less room and so it was easier to negotiate them around the case and plug them in where they needed to be plugged in, both to the RGB controller and to the motherboard. So just to make life a little bit easier there and multiple cable ties across the entirety of those just to neaten things up. Now you can see I've got a lot of cable ties that have been used here, more than are included in the box. So it might be worth buying some extras if you want to neaten things up, but it's not essential because there's actually enough room in this case, even with my awful cable tying to sort things out. I'm not a master at this and I intentionally don't go to town making it really neat because I'm also probably going to take this case apart at some point soon in order to build it again with a different setup and I do that regularly so it just becomes a headache. And obviously now controllers. So I happen to have a spare RGB controller. So I've taken the RGB connections from those front fans and I'm putting them into this controller instead. Now this is an additional purchase obviously I would recommend it. It is an option because then it means all the fan lighting, both the bottom fans, the side fans, and the fans that are on the radiator can all be controlled via NZXT's cam software and synced. But it does mean an extra accessory purchase. Alternatively, you can buy NZXT's fan controller, which can control both the fan power and the RGB lighting from multiple different fans. I'll link to this in the description, and I've done a video separately on it. It's a bit larger and a bit more capable and it frees up some connections on your motherboard. But again, it doesn't control all the RGB. You can only control RGB for six fans 
and the fan power for nine if you use splitter cables. So it's not a perfect solution, but it's better than having multiple RGB controllers, which is what I end up with. Then we've got the front panel USB-A and USB-C connections. I'm running those through there and plugging those in on the right hand side. So these plug in just below the 24 pin power connector on the motherboard. The USB-C cable, now they both plug in in one direction and you'll feel them click into place. So just note that you should feel a click when you push it in if you're seated it in properly. You'll notice the USB-A has a little notch on it so you can only put it in one way round. So just push that in until it clicks into place and it shouldn't be easy to accidentally pull out either. So that will be beneficial. And then we're going to put the data cables in for the SSDs that we installed earlier on. Don't forget those, obviously, on the right hand side and then run them through to the rear. We can then set those up in Windows later to, long, uh, to run alongside the NVMe SSDs. And then don't forget to plug the other end of the cables into the drives themselves along with the SATA power from the power supply units. All well, these just won't work. Uh, so that's very important. But you can see here what I was talking about earlier on about how much room you've got to access the bottom of those there, which is nice because in a lot of cases is a lot more fiddly than this. There's actually quite a lot of space down the bottom here still, at least on this side. The front end where you have to access the motherboard is a little bit more fiddly. So that's something to bear in mind and to watch out for. And then I'm mounting the all-in-one cooler. Now I'd recommend cable tying these cables if you can from the fans and then running them through the top before you seat the radiator onto the top here. Now, as I said, this is a 240 mil radiator and you can see that leaves some space on either side. 360 mil would be preferable because it would fill it up and also they just have better cooling because there's more radiator space and an extra fan. So for something like a high-end CPU like I'm using, you'd probably want a larger one. This is all I had to hand. But you can also see you could go for a 280 because you do have enough space for larger radiators here as well. So options in terms of what you're doing. Again, I'm mounting it with the tubes towards the rear and you'll see I've sort of offset it a little bit. You can adjust the position of it. But the reason I'm not putting it right flush against one way or the other is because I'm actually going to be mounting a fan at the rear as well. So you do have the option to mount a 120 mil fan at the rear of the case. And I'm going to be doing that in a second. But also with the tubes towards the back, they're not interfering with the Dominator RAM. And that was important for this build because I wanted to obviously show off that RAM. Now I'll take that plastic cover off the all-in-one pump head. And we're going to seat that down on top. Tubes down towards the bottom and then the cabling goes towards the top. Now you can adjust the display in NZXT's cam software. So if you need to or if you want to, you can actually put the tubes on another side and then you can just adjust it in the software. It is flexible on how you install the pump head, but this is the cleanest part for this build. And it's a little bit neater because it means I can hide the cables away at the top and the tubes kind of go in a nice direction the way they're sitting there as well, but you could alternatively turn it. So you could turn it 90 degrees or just revolve that head around, put the tubes slightly tighter if you wanted to. So you could put them on the right hand side nearer the RAM and basically you put that down on there and then tighten the thumb screws up. Make sure you tighten those up pretty tight. You want to make sure they're well secured because if not, then there won't be a good contact between the copper plate of the pump head and the CPU and it won't get as good cooling. Don't forget, plug in that single small cable to the AIO pump head or CPU fan connection on the motherboard like I showed earlier on and then run the rest of the cables through to the back. Now there are a lot of cables here and it is a little bit fiddly to get them all through that gap because you've got to get them underneath the fans and through there. It's going to depend on how large your hands are and how clumsy you are. I'm very clumsy as you'll see from a lot of the shots in this video and feeding them back through there can be a bit fiddly but it's very important. We've also got to get the SATA connection for the pump head and the fan connection for the power and then the USB connection for the pump as well and run that all to the bottom of the motherboard and around the rear and obviously just tidying this up as much as possible. You can see it's a bit of a mess and a little bit tricky to do. So with the fan connections, don't forget, there's that splitter cable that comes out the pump head, connect up the two fans to that. I'm actually gonna use the third connection a little bit later on for that final fan that I'm putting in the case, just cause it makes life easier. This is in place of using a system fan header or CPU fan header. Then you've got the RGB connections and the connect up to the controller that come with the cooler 
this are those plugins. So now I've ended up with multiples of these. So you do need to find somewhere to put them. And because I've used, not used a hard disk drive, I actually slipped them under the SSDs. So there is space down there. Then the USB splitter. So that Y splitter for the two USB connections, one from the pump and one from the RGB controller. And then that plugs into the bottom of the motherboard. Very important if you want to control the display and the RGB lighting through NZXT's cam software. Then we have the front panel connection. This is for the case for the power button. And that plugs in on the bottom right of your motherboard. Check your motherboard manual to see where, but basically it just slots in there. Really straightforward to do. And then this is another accessory that I'd recommend purchasing. This is NZXT's USB hub. So this takes four USB connections and puts them into a single connector that plugs into the motherboard. Now this is great in my instance because I'm using multiple RGB controllers now for the fans on the case, for the fans on the radiator, for the extra fans on the case. And so having the USB hub means I can plug in three extra USB connections into a single connector. This is powered, so it requires SATA power. So you need another SATA power connection from your power supply unit, which is why it's great that it's daisy chainable, but you might need two of those cables. And then there's a large connector that plugs into the top purple connector on top of this, and then that connects up to the motherboard. This means you can make the most of all these connections without having to worry about not having enough USB connectors. So it is an alternative. It is an additional purchase, but it's fairly affordable and really works very well. I've used it in multiple builds now, and I would highly recommend it because it makes life a lot easier and you don't have to fret about not having enough USB connectors. Don't forget to plug that in as well though, so that those connections can be recognized by Windows and by Cam. And then we can just power it on and make sure everything's working. Now, as you see, the fans will default to white as standard, which is much nicer than the usual rainbow view that you get when you set up a case like this. And they're all spinning nicely as they should be. So everything's connected nicely, which is great. If not, make sure the system fan connections are in place as they should be on the motherboard and the connectors on the pump as well. You should hopefully see the display working. If you don't, and the USB connection is not in place or the SATA power connections, so make sure those are all connected up. Now I'm going to install the graphics card. Now I'm actually going to set this up in two different ways. So stick with me in a minute because I'm going to show you the vertical mounting option, which is another additional purchase, but one that does look quite nice actually. But the standard installation is pretty simple. This is a 4090, by the way. So this is a Strix 4090 white edition. It's my own GPU. And you can see that it does actually fit in this case. And there's still a little bit of space at the end as well. So it it is possible to fit one in there in case you're wondering. And you just secure that down with the screws that come out of those back plates. One thing that I did have a problem with here was the power cable. So this is a special power cable, 600 watt, which comes with the RM shift. It's a Corsair cable. You can actually purchase it separately. It works with that NVIDIA adapter. And it is a little bit tricky because it wasn't quite long enough. So... I'm not happy with how it's turned out in terms of length. I tried to get it to come from the bottom. It won't. It'll only come from the side like this. So it's a bit garish in, in this setup. It's not ideal, but it hasn't got loads of pressure on it. And that's really important. You don't want to put a lot of tension on this, especially with a high-end GPU from the 40 series, because there are problems with those cables melting. So you can see how that's run through and that's set up there. And... You probably wouldn't have the same issue with a normal PSU, but with a shift I did. And then you can see, even with all that cable mess, you can shut the door and just pretend it doesn't exist. So your cable shame is hidden from everybody. And it's fine because it's just back there and it's not interfering with the airflow in any way. So it's fine. And then we put the panels back on and set it all up so it's finished. Now, obviously, this is the standard build and what it might look like if you're not planning on vertical mounting and you just want to set it up in this way. And... It's been pretty smooth, as you can see. I've had a reasonable experience building in it, and you should too if you're following along with this guide. Uh, hopefully you found it insightful. And if you have, subscribe and drop me a comment down below to help me out with this and so other people can see it. You'll notice I'm also using a little adapter in there, which is included with the GPU to help with anti-sag. And then peel off the 
stickers. Now, some people would say do this beforehand, and I will drop that in there. It is worth peeling those stickers off before you actually build the PC. There is a risk of static damage. I've never had it happen to me, and I do live in the UK where we have grounded power plugs, and I'm using an anti-static mat while building, so it shouldn't be an issue, but I have heard reports of problems with people peeling off the stickers and then finding they've shorted out their PC. So just take that knowledge with you, do with it what you will, but I don't wanna be blamed for your PC dying. So <laughs> there is the final build in the standard setup. In a second, as I said, I'm gonna show you the vertical mounting and the difference there. Well, I'm pretty happy with how it's come out. And apart from that GPU cable, which looks a bit messy, but otherwise it looks really nice. And from multiple angles, it looks really good. So as I said at the beginning of the video, a very nice case for the money and an interesting setup. Those fans you can now see on the side are pointed directly at the graphics card. And yes, the GPU is going to be pulling air from below at the moment, but it's also going to have cold air blowing over it from an angle, which is pretty interesting. I'm not seeing a build like this before. And you've got the best of both worlds now because you've got airflow from the front, but you've also got that glass panel still, so you can see loads of it in there. But you've also got good airflow, in theory, and good looks from multiple angles. And it's kind of eye-catching as well. And with all that vented panels, you should have good airflow, but still maintain like the dust exclusion. Um, that's something you'd have to test over time and see how it gets on, but I'm pretty sure it'll be okay. Those panels should be easy to remove and clean. Now, the cooler itself, as you can see, can display all sorts of things, including GIFs and temperature readouts. So you can see the GPU and CPU temps here. I will note that, as I said, the Elite one is better because you might spy some GIFs in here where you only get a square in the middle. So the whole display doesn't fill up. It's a bit weird. It's one downside to this version of the cooler. It's not quite as fancy as the Elite version, but it still looks pretty good. And... Let me know what you think of this setup and how it is like this. Now, I happen to have a vertical mounting bracket that I used for a previous NZXT build, and it is an additional purchase, but it does mean that you could put the 4090 into a nicer position. So I wanted to do that just to show what it was like and to see whether it would be possible, whether it would interfere with the cooler and other things. So now I've just got to take it all apart again <laughs> and set it up. I also happen to have another spare 120 mil fan, which I'm going to use on the rear. Now it's worth noting that you only fit a 120 mil fan there, but if you want to, you can. And this is another core fan, so the wiring logic is fairly straightforward because we can use one of the RGB controllers that we've always set up there, and then a system fan header to connect it up, and then it just screws into the rear. Again, I'm facing it in towards the case. So now you can see we've got three intake fans on the side, two 140 mil intake fans on the bottom, and then we've got one rear exhaust fan and two top exhaust fans through the radiator. I actually ended up connecting the RGB connector to the controller that came with the Kraken cooler, so the lighting will be synced there, and then the fan power also to the pump head, which isn't necessarily logical. You could use a system fan header instead but, you know, it will still power that. It's intended to power it, so why not? And then put the door back on again and hide that shame away. Now, with the vertical mounting bracket, you need to take out all of the back plates for the GPU and remove them. Now, this is a separate purchase as well, so you will need to find that, and I'll link to it in the description, but you basically just unscrew and pop all of these out, and then we can vertically mount the GPU so it'll be facing towards the glass and you'll have a nicer view of it. The advantage of this bracket is the design of it means that it sits quite far back because it slots into those PCIe brackets and it actually sits away from the glass. So it shouldn't impact the thermal performance. And actually, from what I've seen, it doesn't seem to either, which is nice because historically I've seen some brackets like this where it sits far too close to the glass and then it ends up choking the GPU but that doesn't seem like it's going to be the case here. And also, as you'll see in a second, it doesn't get in the way of anything else either. So it actually ends up looking really nice. The way this works is the cable plugs into that top PCIe X16 slot in the same way the graphics card just did to make sure you've got maximum speed and performance out of it. And then you just basically put the tray in and slot it in in the same way you would a graphics card. So it slips in the back there and then it's secured 
with two screws in the back plate of the case. You'll notice as well at the bottom of this vertical mounting bracket is a little foot that you can roll out and then that sits at the bottom to give you some support for your GPU in terms of anti-sag or at least the bracket anyway. And it's just in the right position here to sit between the 240 mil fans on the bottom of the case. So that's pretty beneficial. I did find the cable was again a little bit of fiddly to plug in, but it does look a little bit nicer now instead of sort of coming at a horrible angle. And then we just pop the glass back on. And now we've got a much nicer looking finish. Now you will notice that glass just ever so slightly pushes up against the tubes of the pump. And I've tidied it up a little bit by putting a little tie on there. It's not a mega problem. And as I said, if you maybe put the pump with the tubes on the right hand side, that would obviously make those a little bit shorter. So perhaps it wouldn't protrude against the glass, but you can see the way the GPU is sitting, the tubes sort of sit on top of the GPU and push slightly towards the glass, perhaps not ideal, but there is room in there. So if you're wondering whether there was room in this case for a 4090, the answer is yes. And I think that the thermal performance should be pretty good because now we've got cold air blowing on the back of it and it'll be sucking air from the front where the panel is, but also it's got air blowing from below as well. So there's quite a few sort of fans blowing air in different directions on this GPU. And my experience with it has been that it hasn't got too hot. Also, the final product now looks a lot nicer. I think it's probably worth paying out the extra for that vertical mounting. And you'll see it isn't interfering with the pump head. However, the cabling for the power cable does get in the way of the Dominator RAM just a smidge. So not 100% happy with that. And you might not be either. Something to consider. So hopefully you've enjoyed this fully in-depth view on the H6 Flow RGB. If you did, subscribe and drop me a comment down below. Pop over to Discord and say hello and let me know what you think. And I appreciate your support. If you could just give me a little like and uh, anything else that you can do to help support the channel. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great life.